Great Anarchists Number 8 Lucy Parsons by Ruth Kinna and Clifford Harbour In 1900, a Republican-leaning U.S. local broadsheet crowned Lucy Parsons an anarchist queen. The coronation bucked a trend. The press usually referred to her as the widow of Albert Parsons, one of the anarchists executed in 1887 following the bombing of a labour demonstration in Chicago's Haymarket Square. The coupling was not entirely inappropriate. Having spearheaded the defence campaigns for the accused, she frequently referred to the injustice of the trial to spotlight the steeliness of capitalist slavocracy. However, her association with Albert is easily misconstrued. She never played second fiddle to Albert, nor stood in his shadow. She was a talented writer, orator and organiser in her own right. A keen advocate of independent labour organising in the late 19th century, Parsons was active in the Knights of Labour and the Anarchist International Working People's Association. In 1905, she joined the Industrial Workers of the World, or IWW. She wrote regularly for the Anarchist Socialist Press and lectured across America, refusing to be cowed by police bans or arrests for riot that followed as a consequence of her defiance. In 1888, she spoke at a Haymarket Memorial Rally in London, leaving a deep impression on the anarchists in William Morris's Socialist League. As head of the Chicago Reds, Parsons was to Chicago what Louise Michel was to Paris, and her influence, like Michel's, extended well beyond the city's limits. Like most anarchists of the period, Parsons was forever asked questions about political violence and terrorist tactics. Deeply concerned about the capacity of the print media to shape public perceptions, she scrupulously avoided reductive analysis. In a widely syndicated interview, published after President McKinley's killing in 1901, she ventured that the assailant, Leon Chaugosh, was mentally ill. If this sounded like straightforward censure, Parsons based her diagnosis on his evident misunderstanding of class power. She judged Chagrash deluded because he had wrongly thought that there was something to be gained from the shooting. Anyone in their right mind could see he had mistaken the symbol for the source. It was the trusts and heads of trusts who wielded real power, not the people's temporary chief executives. Parsons' qualified critique reflected her general view that organised government was in the pay of economic lobbyists and therefore largely insulated from its electors. Her refusal to condemn political violence, even as anti-anarchist hysteria reached fever pitch, also reflected an eagerness to resist binary tactics. Parsons once argued that there were two main categories of anarchist, militant and philosophical. The latter were agitators and teachers who believed in organisation, while militants eschewed organisation and believed in independent action, each one choosing their own path. Gitano Bresci, assassin of King Umberto I, was an example of this type. Parsons described herself as an old-school anarchist because she advocated formal organisation to support sustained propaganda. Organisation was essential for the construction of movements capable of withstanding capitalist intimidation, infiltration and vigilante actions. Without it, workers were easy prey for the bosses. Yet, Parsons had a foot in both camps and appreciated the galvanising power of the individual act. Her 1884 clarion call, word to Trump's, declared that organisation would be a detriment to those willing to petition the rich with explosives. Similarly, in 1900, she participated in the Brescia Solidarity Meeting, backing the appeal to working men to come in crowds. For Parsons, the chief enemy was inertia. As she put it, passivity while slavery is stealing over us is a crime. Class War Born to an enslaved woman in 1851, Parsons explored class conflict through the prism of the American Civil War. When she spoke about the war, she referred to the brutality of the fighting, the nobility of the cause and the bitterness of its betrayal. It had been waged to end oppression, for liberation and to put an end to enslavement. For Parsons, this meant abolishing both chattel slavery and the structural oppressions it epitomised. Only one of these aims had been realised. Abraham Lincoln had emancipated the slaves, but the oppression continued. Returning home from the battlefields, the ordinary soldiers discovered that bloated aristocracy 
and crude moneydocracy, as she termed it, had won the day, and that their lives now hinged on the benevolence of the slimy cards who had made a fast buck from turning out their paste bottom boots. The overseer's whip is now fully supplanted by the lash of hunger, she said, and the auction block by the chain gang and the convict cell. When Ulysses Grunt accepted Robert E. Lee's surrender to bring hostilities to a formal end, the war rumbled on. Parsons observed that the political settlement signalled an important realignment of forces and a change in tactics. Having settled the issue of individual property rights, slavers on both sides of the Confederate Unionist divide regrouped, forging new alliances to wage covert war against the veterans who had done their killing and anyone else who attempted to resist enslavement. Dispensing with the heavy artillery, the owners now wielded the state's constitutional powers, elaborate electoral machinery, the lying monopolistic press, Pinkerton private militias and armed police to quell resistance. This was class war. It appeared less gruesome than the pitched battles that characterised the Civil War, but the oppressors pursued it with the same viciousness. Parsons addressed black workers to explain. The same land which you once tilled as a chattel slave, you still till as a wage slave, and in the same cabin which you then entered at Eve, not knowing but what you would be sold from wife and little ones before the morrow's setting sun, you now enter with dread, lest you will be slain by the assassin hand of those who once would have sold you if they did not like you. In fact, whereas the Civil War had been fought with honour, the class war was waged shamefully. Unlike General Grant, who accepted Lee's capitulation magnanimously, the state of Illinois ran Albert Parsons through when he gave himself up for trial. It was reasonable to assume that the amnesties that the Union granted the rebels in the Reconstruction era would never be extended to the anarchists and their allies who resisted the new arrangements. Workers should draw their own conclusions. Referring to the 1886 killing spree in Carlton, Mississippi, which resulted in 23 deaths, Parsons told her black audience, as to those local, periodical, damnable massacres to which you are at all times liable, these you must revenge in your own way. Are you deaf, dumb and blind to the atrocities that you are subjected to? Have the gaping wounds of your dead comrades become so common that they no longer move you? Is your heart a heart of stone, or its palpitations those of cowards, that you slink to your wretched abode and offer no resistance? Do you need more horrible realities than these to goad you on to deeds of revenge, that will at least make your oppressors dread you. Parsons described the class war as a war against Christian civilization. It had three fronts. One was against the system of economic and industrial robbery, which enabled capitalists to claim ownership of the things that workers produced, from everyday consumables to the astonishing buildings that fashioned the city skylines. The second was the organized fraud of government. Happy people, she argued, needed no government and were instead inclined towards individualism or real self-government. Take away the complex systems required to maintain the injustice of capitalist oppression and people would order themselves. The third front was against religion. Parsons understood this in a narrow sense to refer to the hypocrisy of church leaders who taught one set of ethics and practiced another and also understood religion in a broad sense to refer to the ideology of equal opportunity and the myth of classlessness that pervaded America. Parsons knew from walking the streets of New York and Chicago that workers lived in abject poverty, packed like sardines, she said, into squalid tenements on filthy sidewalks, and that their children had no access to the parks and amenities that adorned the areas uptown. The picture was one of despair, at once degrading, disgusting and depressing, she said, making do with coffee wagons and soup kitchens, and taking the charity that the robber class handed out like dope to keep them quiet, they desperately poured over the job adverts that peppered the yellow press, also absorbing the messages that instructed them to cling tightly to the American dream. Class and Solidarity Parsons believed that all workers were exploited by capitalists, but she also argued that the experience of exploitation was felt more or less sharply by subsets of workers. In other words, gender and race operated independently of class as determinants of oppression. 
women had long been regarded as inferior to men, turned into household drudges and tolerated on condition that they provide their masters with progeny. Some 20th century new women were able to venture outside the domestic sphere, receive education and enjoy independence. They did not lack inspiring role models to help them make their way. Louise Michel was one. She shone like a pillar of light or a star of hope, Parsons said. Still, most women remain man-tagged, as she put it. The better educated were often groomed for domestic service and waitressing, where social norms dictated that applicants should be under 40, good-looking and wholesome. For the rest, life remained a grind. In her visits to the city ghettos, Parsons noted the relationship between hardship and child-rearing. The more poverty-stricken the appearance of the women, she said, the greater number of children they seemed to have clinging to their skirts. Women were exploited more ruthlessly than men, she said, simply because they were women. They were the slaves of the slaves, Parsons said. Similarly, black Americans were regarded as inferior to whites and routinely subject to racist abuse and violence. At the time of the Carlton Massacre, Parsons maintained that the violence had not been racially motivated. Relative poverty was the more important explanatory factor. Black workers in the South were poorer as a class than their white wage slave brothers in the North, she said. By 1892, she had changed her mind. Hearing news of the lynchings then reaching a peak in the South, she compared American racist violence to Russian anti-Semitism. As vulnerable as the Jews were under Tsarism, she argued that their sufferings were as nothing compared to the lashings and lynching taking place across the old rebel states. Parsons reported that leering, white-skinned, black-hearted brutes stripped women bare, beat them insensible and strangled them from the limbs of trees. This was race war, intensified by gender discrimination and class hatred. Parsons' analysis of oppression was reflected in her understanding of solidarity. It had four aspects. First, solidarity was process. Workers had to learn how to exert collective force, build solidarity of interest as a mass, she said, and act as a class. Second, the process involved distinguishing between class interest and class membership. While it was impossible to reconcile workers' and owners' interests, it was nevertheless possible for individuals to transcend economic class divisions. Florence Nightingale, one of Parsons' famous women of history, blazed this trail. Far from want, she had risked her well-being to bring relief to that most stupid victim of our present system, the soldier, Parsons said. In doing so, Nightingale had demonstrated solidarity of interest with the oppressed. Third, solidarity meant standing firm with workers who apparently betrayed class interest, notably scabs. These workers were not to be despised. A scab was just a poverty-stricken, disheartened wage slave, she said. Solidarity demanded that workers refuse to handle scabbed goods, but also that they heal the divisions that owners created within the mass movement. Fourth, solidarity meant supporting independent organisation and leadership within the workers' movements. Endorsing the words of an anonymous black anti-racist organiser, Parsons noted, the white race furnished us one John Brown. The next must come from our own race. War and Peace Parsons believed that there could be no peace without liberation and that workers were always right to resist exploitation and oppression. She never revised her conception of class war and she scoffed at those who preached peace as a strategic response to domination. Why was lamb-like behaviour demanded only of workers and never owners, she asked. Why should they be quiet while starving or receiving just sufficient for the laborious toll to keep body and soul together and to produce more slaves for the bosses? Yet towards the end of her life she concluded that she was unlikely to witness the demise of capitalism as she had once anticipated. Her frank assessment was that anarchism remained too far away from the mental level of the masses. Anti-anarchist propaganda was partly to blame. It was easy for the authorities to paint anarchism as dangerous and unruly. Parsons' own rhetoric was perhaps misjudged in this respect, but rather than change tack or blame the opposition, she invited anarchists to acknowledge their own deficiencies. 
they had failed to sustain organisations essential for the promotion of anarchist ideas. Parsons' late speeches often harked back to Haymarket. There was some nostalgia in this, but a larger dose of hope. Haymarket was an historical trigger for the righteous anger and indignation government smothered. At a wildcat May Day rally in 1930, as the US economy hurtled towards collapse, she warmed to the sight of young people who will drop work when work is so scarce, come out in the midweek and defy the capitalist classes, come out in the sunlight, standing solid for shorter hours and better conditions. Those are the kind of people we have got to have, she said. There was no want of opportunity. These short introductions delve into the anarchist canon to recover some of the distinctive ideas that historical anarchists advanced to address problems relevant to their circumstances. Although these contexts were special, many of the issues the anarchists wrestled with still plague our lives. Anarchists developed a body of writing about power, domination, injustice and exploitation, education, prisons and a lot more besides. Honing in on different facets of the anarchist canon is not just an interesting archaeological exercise. The persistence, development and adaptation of anarchist traditions depends on our surveying the historical landscape of ideas and drawing on the resources it contains. The theoretical toolbox that this small assortment of anarchists helped to construct is there to use, amend and adapt. Agitate, educate, organise. Read by Barbara Graham and Jim Donaghy, Red Anarchist is a 10-part pamphlet series written by Ruth Kinna with artwork by Clifford Harper and published by Dog Section Press and Active Distribution in 2018-2019. The pamphlet's subjects are Peter Kropotkin, Voltairine de Clare, Michael Bakunin, Louise Michel, Oscar Wilde, Max Stirner, Pierre-Joseph Proudhon, Lucy Parsons, William Godwin and Eric Malatesta. Visit dogsection.org or activedistribution.org to find out more and click the link to find our readings of the other pamphlets in the series.